Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and of course this is uh, Shackleton. Very, very docile mood today. He's purring, and he's got cat fur all over me, of course. So today I'm going to talk about some very significant aspects of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. First of all, I'm going to put it into the context of pandemics throughout history. So I'll talk about, you know, um, what's happened in the in the past, what the largest pandemics were, you know, all the way from the Black Death or the so-called bubonic plague, running from 1347 to 1351, that killed an estimated 200 million people, which was about half of the global population at that at the time when it hit. And after I've talked about a bit about the history of pandemics in terms of the population at the time when they occurred, I'll talk about some of the um, significant... Um, I'll, I'll try to address the question as to whether the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be seasonal. In other words, will it decrease in intensity as the northern hemisphere goes into summer and that would probably lead to a corresponding increase in intensity in the southern hemisphere so there's been a number of papers that are discussing that so i'll, I'll talk about those in 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 great detail that's the, the, the that's the main gist of what i want to talk about today so let me show you i think he's going to want to escape so there you go. Do you want to go? Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't get my mic. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the cat wants to relax and sleep on the chair next to me. It's funny. He, he always comes into this room um, when I'm uh, about to film videos. Helps me prepare. Okay, so first of all, um, you're probably familiar with my website, paulbeckwith.net. So uh, check it out, and please consider donating uh, to support my research on videos. And I will get to more climate-related videos, but um, right now, of course, the virus and how it's um, affecting different countries is first and foremost on my mind, as I'm sure it is on your mind. And all of these things I'm talking about, you can just Google the title to find. Um, there's too many links for me to to put them all and it's just easier you know just google 10 thoughts on the power of pandemics if you want to see this article it's the first thing that pops up so this is by andrew nick nikiforic an, an award um, winning journalist and he's written a few books on the plague so basically they disrupt reveal renew they give opportunity to rethink what we've come to believe is normal you know just a reminder of washing your hands, soap's the best thing, warm water, wash for 20 or 30 seconds, rinse. Get all those crevices between your fingers. The soap is a molecule, a polar molecule that actually pulls apart the virus. It annihilates the virus. It is the microbes who will have the last word. This is a quote by Louis Pasteur. Of course, pasteurized milk, penicillin, in 2018, the Commission on Creating a Global Health Risk Framework for the Future, which is the U.S. Panel of Health Experts, they warned that the conditions for infectious disease emergence and contagion are more dangerous than ever due to overpopulation, the increase to urbanization, people going into the cities from, from rural areas, industrial livestock, um, and mobility of people flying all over the world, the ability to spread things extremely quickly. This panel in 2016, they estimated that there was a 20% chance that four pandemics could unsettle the globe over the next century. Well, four years later, you know, it looks like we're in the first, you know, one. And, you know, I've argued in previous videos that climate change is leading to higher and higher risks of plagues. A Nobel Prize winning biologist, Joshua Lederberg, warned more than a decade ago that the world had entered a disquieting era of plague making. 
Okay, we've crowded together a hotbed of opportunity for infectious agents to spread over a significant part of the population. Affluent, mobile people, ready and willing and able to carry affliction all over the world within 24 hours notice. This condensation, sort of a compression of people, stratification and mobility is unique, defining us as a very different species from what we were 100 years ago. You know, these, um, these pandemics, they're like tsunamis or bombs. They can wash over continents, changing everything. Okay, or they can blow up fossilized old institutions, destabilize political dynasties. They've stopped wars, they've started them in the past, they've rattled, even collapsed civilizations. They're basically in enormous biological recalibrations, if you like. Okay, so they're a critical and immutable social force that shape our lives. They paralyze and disrupt, they reveal and renew. So 10 characteristics that he's put, um, that mostly the global economy and the elites, the politicians, people in charge, power structures, have mostly ignored about the energy of pandemics. Pandem one, pandemics are one of the four biblical horsemen that give meaning to our lives and shape human history. Whether or not you believe um, in the Bible and its teachings, it's a historical document. Um, you know, it's sort of, it's how people thought about things at the time it was written. So the four horsemen, the white horse represents the word of truth, God or truth, if you're not religious. The red horse is the power of the state, the country over peace and war. The black horse for good and ill commands the busts and booms of economics and famine. The fourth horseman is the microbial life and pestilence. Okay. Um, he wrote a book called The Fourth Horseman 30 years ago. Okay, we don't like to think that we're part of history anymore, but we are walking memories of past plagues. Of course, our lives, what we have now, are shaped by everything that's happened in the past. Pandemics may appear as random events, but they're really the product of cultivated vulnerabilities by different citizen civilizations at different times. So there's nothing random about this. And, you know, just four years ago, this commission gave, you know, high odds for there being something, you know, soon. So we have a long history, humanity, of provoking plagues with overcrowding, dirty water, deforestation, poor nutrition, ruinous poverty, soil erosion, and novel agricultural practices. So influenza started unsettling the planet Chinese, when Chinese farmers added ducks to rice paddies to control insects in the 16th century. This put avian or bird-based viruses in close proximity to pigs, which helped the, the virus and jump to humans. So-called non-pharmaceutical inventions, such as hand washing, social isolation, and the banning of crowds can dramatically slow the spread of a viral plague. Vaccines and drugs, we can't count on them. They rarely arrive on the scene until the pandemic has waned. Changes in human behavior, housing, nutrition, and hygiene have always had the most impact on slowing or stopping plagues. Okay, so if you look at COVID-19, how it's played out in South Korea and Italy, the difference is it shows how human behavior can alter outcomes. So South Korea, close to China, you know, they tested early, they traced down the infected and they isolated them in their homes and they restricted travel. Italy did not test or contain aggressively. Korea, S South Korea tested 240,000 people to find and isolate nearly 8,000 cases. Italy tested 97,000 people and watched infections explode much higher than 20,000 now, approaching 30,000 if not reached already. South Korea had 67 deaths. Italy's lost more than, um, you know, more than uh, 1,266 citizens. With a death, the death rate in Italy is 7%. When the medical system gets um, swamped, then the people with the virus that need medical care um, use up the limited amounts of machines. There's a lot of triage, the older people there's no machines for. But don't forget all the people that are normally in hospitals in critical care. Okay, those people are displaced. So if the death rate from the 
virus itself is three and a half, four percent in hospitals, then you have all those other other critical people, so that brings up the death rate. You know, so seven percent in Italy, you know, we could probably see ten percent in some countries because of a swamped hospital system. Pandemics invite a rude parade of blame, conspiracies, and religious zealotry. Okay, you scapegoat people. So when the plague um, swept through Europe, people scapegoated Jews for spreading black death. But Jew Jewish people practiced better hygiene and were suspected by the afflicted people. During the Industrial Revolution, working people thought that the rich had invented cholera to murder the poor. They attacked, in scores of riots, they attacked the rich, hospital, and doctors. When Spanish pandemic hit Africa, South Africans blamed blacks and, uh, you know, so on, okay? Um, presently, there's a surge of racism against Chinese people, even though the virus probably didn't originate there, it just spread there. Okay, um, so it's an excellent article. Global trade has always played a formidable role in disease exchanges. So back in, in the 13th century Europe, the Silk Road Chinese trade brought rats and fleas to Europe. There was a demographic collapse. One in four people died. Slave trade had bombarded two continents with epidemics. Cholera followed European trade routes to the slums of major cities from the Ganges Delta. Global steamship travel carried influenza around the world, spread the so-called Spanish flu. You know, now we've got air travel. You can bring things from one place to another every 20, you know, within a day or so. The Black Death killed so many people that it changed society. They, people had to increase wages, decrease rents. It changed humans, humankind's relationship with God and nature, okay? So as these great disturbances happen, pandemics um, unsettle and they change economies, okay? Smallpox emptied the Americas, let Spain loot the region of its gold and silver. Smallpox killed off the entire, basically, First Nations on the plains. Spanish flu killed 50 million people, up to 100 million, and erased 5% of global uh, gross domestic production, and so on. It goes on and on. Basically, pandemics rudely outline weaknesses and faults in political leadership. Good leaders lessen their impacts. Think um, South Korea. Incompetent leaders add to the gravity. I think, unfortunately, the U.S. will be one of the worst places in the world. Hopefully I'm proven wrong. Um... President Woodrow Wilson in the U.S. was so focused on the First World War that he repeated, ignored repeated warnings about influenza and its impact on troop movement. So Canadian and U.S. authorities, towards the end of the war, war they put sick troops on cramped ships with poor ventilation. Flu killed 675,000 Americans. The trench warfare claimed 53,000. Okay, it was the flu. I think the flu ended the, the war. Okay, not enough adequate testing and containment in clearly in the U.S. Pandemics are rarely equal opportunity events. They scare everybody equally maybe, but they don't kill every, everyone. They tend to target the poor, the vulnerable, and those wounded by bad health. Black death struck down both rich and poor, but focused on the malnutritious, malnourished and frail. Smallpox became a terror for indigenous people because they had no immunity to this old world virus. You know, people living in temperate climate in the northern hemisphere experiencing winters and summers, winters and summer, were exposed to much more, um, much more different, many more different viruses and things, um, colds, and built up immunities. Um, during the Spanish flu, members of First Nations died at rates seven times higher than British Columbia's provincial average. Okay, ultimately, pandemics invite us to question disturbances in the human family. Okay, you know, the way we do things. Um, the humbled will be thankful, you know, long after the monotony of deprivation and separation. Okay, you can read this. The survivors of pandemics will, you know, will be um, really thankful for getting through things.